Ah, yes. Welcome into Action Movie Rewind, where we do deep dives into some of the most prominent action movies of all time. The biggest blockbusters with the most explosions and deaths and the biggest star actors in the history of action movie cinema. And gentlemen, we're staying in the same calendar year as last week, 1997. So last week, we dove into Face Off. First time Judd's ever seen Face Off. Mm -hmm. But 1997 was right in the middle of a peak era of action movies. Air Force One, starring Harrison Ford, is on the docket for today. Now, Declan, you have never seen this movie until this week, right? Never saw it. Never saw it till today. I'm okay. so excited for our statements. I'm shocked by that. Mm -hmm. It is. Uh, I mean, it's right there. Like you were, you were probably what first grade when this movie came out. Somewhere yeah, there. I was, I was probably like four or five. Yeah, probably like, so. So, so kindergarten, in kindergarten or something. Yeah, nursery school. All right, here is the summary of Air Force One. After making a speech in Moscow vowing to never negotiate with terrorists, President James Marshall, played by Harrison Ford, boards Air Force One with his family and advisors. When a group of terrorists led by Ivan Korshinov, uh, played by Gary Oldman, hijacks the flight, the president's principles are put to the test. Feigning escape, ex-soldier Marshall stows away in the aircraft and must race against time to rescue his family and everybody else on board. 78% on Rotten Tomatoes. I'd like to meet the other 22%, quite frankly. $85 million budget turned into $315 million at the box office. The Rotten Tomatoes critics' consensus says, quote, this late-period Harrison Ford actioner is full of palpable, if not entirely seamless, thrills. Harrison Ford, <laughs> Gary Oldman... William H. Macy Love and William Macy. Glenn Close among the stars in this movie. Just a few fun production notes for you guys. Feel free to chime in here, too. Uh, Air Force One is shown as being equipped with a one-person escape pod for emergency use by the president. It was also done this way in at least three other films, Escape from New York, Bermuda Tentacles, and Big Game. The actual Air Force One, at least in 1997, did not have an escape pod. Interesting. I got so if this happens, you're screwed yeah. is kind of what they're saying. Or you're so tough, you don't care about the escape yeah. pod. doesn't matter. You yeah, I got, I, got, I got thoughts on the escape pod. I thought that was All one right. of the first things that stood out to me. All I right. don't want to make this uh, like currently political, but how long would Joe Biden have lasted if this were him instead of Harrison Ford on that plane? About 15 topic. seconds. <laughs> it's a whole topic. Yeah. <laughs> it's a... Could say um, the same for Donald Trump, by the way. I don't know that was, those guys last 15 minutes on that on Who's that the last... Who's the last real president that you think could have even put oh, up man. a semblance of this fight? W. Clint? Who? The w. 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 I don't Absolutely. know, man. I think he's hiding in the corner. <laughs> oh, God. He's taking the escape pod out, first of all. He's not sticking around. I'm trying to think of, like, who are some of the... Reagan? Clinton? Well, you got to remember, all these guys are usually, you know, 65, 70 years old here, too. And uh, I, I think... President Marshall looks like he's one of the younger presidents yeah. in the last you know, 100 years or so. Obama? He's uh, pretty a uh, pretty athletic young. guy. I don't know. He was yeah. young. I, I Bill, mean, I, I a young a young Bill Clinton. And by the way, here's a production note. Okay. Bill Clinton saw the film twice while in office and gave it good review. This movie was so great in the middle of Bill Clinton's controversial more presidency. Yeah. He's like, I want to go see that again, actually. It's great. Oh, you put on Air Force One. Yeah. <laughs> Monica. <laughs> yeah, do you think you ever watched it with Monica? Oh, my God. Put it back part. on again. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. He noted that certain <laughs> elements of the film's version of Air Force One, such as the escape pod and the rear parachute ramp, did not reflect the features of the actual Air Force One. Although, since many of Air Force One's features are highly classified and need to know, these features cannot be completely ruled out. So maybe he was lying. I don't know. <laughs> the rear parachute. Oh, I can't wait to get to that. <laughs> Uh, and then Kevin Costner was offered the role of President James Marshall, but turned it down as he had other commitments. And the script was given to Harrison Ford, who then accepted it. So I could see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kevin Costner seems That's pretty like a seamless. pretty presidential guy, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Young, athletic enough. Yes, I could definitely see that. Yeah. All right, let's get to statements here on one of the great 90s action movies, Air Force One. Judd, you lead us off. Okay, so we, we did this film back in the first incarnation of AMR, 
And so, and like, there's a ton of statements just about the film itself and like small picture things. And as you said, the escape pod and things, but here's my first statement going bigger picture now. And I don't think I talked about this or, uh, or broached this when we did the AMR review of Air Force One previously. There is an unbelievable amount of inefficiency and just plain old buffoonery from both sides here. <laughs> Like the lack of organization from both sides. And I'll just give, give you a, a small, like, small piece. And then we can certainly discuss. So President Marshall is in the bottom of the plane and he didn't take the escape pod. Mm -hmm. And Gary Oldman's character thinks at first it's a Secret Service guy who's like, who kills his buddy at first and then blah, blah, blah. But there's never a thorough basically let's all go down there and find out because if it's one guy we can kill him they send like two guys at first they said <laughs> one guy like you've commandeered the plane and you've got i think i believe at the end of the day it was six bad guys and and then the and then the uh the mole yeah. from president marshall's cabinet i think it's seven guys total before well, at one point they just completely abandoned and ignored i know the couple guys got killed but they had like abandoned that floor and so 50 hostages are just jumping out yes. with parachutes yeah. for so like a half hour yeah. so the inefficiency what? of this entire thing and then and then from uh from the president's side like okay there, there's that there's the gun uh the gun battle to start the whole thing off and a bunch of folks are dead but like are you telling me nobody else has a gun or something like it is six guys and the seventh guy can't really show himself or he's really screwed too right so the inefficiency from both sides of how to approach this uh this very dramatic situation to me was really a losing play yeah i kind of <laughs> felt like listen these guys had such an airtight plan and that actually brings me to my first statement here is which is who are the random Russian journalists that just get full access to oh, Air I've Force got that One? In my notes too. I you're gonna know. get okay. You're gonna get yep. ten minutes with the president, twenty yep. minutes with this guy over here, and here are a bunch of inside secrets about the yes. layout of That's Air right. Force One. While yes. I flirt with you a little bit and make some mm. sensuous mm. eye contact. Yes. So, so these guys had it planned out. They were gonna murder the actual Russian journalists and take their badges and fingerprints and everything. And so they have, however they have detailed this, they made their way onto freaking Air Force One and had a mole inside the plane. Yep. The amount of planning and meticulous detail that goes into all those things, then when they're on the plane, eventually, they just get really spacey and disorganized yeah. with, okay, if this goes wrong, we're pretty much screwed, right? If, if, <laughs> but yeah, like, who, like, how did these guys just... Are, the, are and, and does media get to fly in Air Force One? That's a thing, right? Like sometimes yeah. media will fly in Air yeah. Force One. I believe so. Yeah, but okay. I don't know that. Like they just accept. Like I'm from a school group. Can I fly on Air Force One? I'm Hi, from, I'm from State. Get special access. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think so. Like I think it's credential journalists who cover the president. So so it's I'm like like you. so sorry to uh ABC and NBC and Dan Rather. Sorry, you guys are going to kind of sit in the back there. There's some sandwiches back there, but uh Net News is going to get full access to anything they want within the plane. <laughs> <laughs> It's like they're, what? They're almost should be like a prequel to this movie. Like, I want to know more information. I want to know how they get on the plane. Mold, yeah, how they get on the plane. What was the organization that like they were well, working for? They killed. So they they killed the pack of journalists who were supposed to be on Air Force One. Yeah, the Russian journalists are killed by this yeah. group. They then steal their. Fi they must have cut off their fingertips or something, because part of the security is to put your finger on the computer pad. So they must have killed those guys, cut off their fingertips, so they passed as them. So, like, you know how they did it, but again, to Phil's point, like, is this just an all-access thing? Like, yeah, we'd, we'd really like to go on Air Force One. Oh, no problem at all. You're going to get time with the president. Like, yeah. that's my... I'm with you on that. That's There's just a lot of buffoonery here. Yeah, it just feels like... I don't know. It just feels like... How do you... No, oh, Declan, you're next. <laughs> Uh, so I, I had original 1A statement, but I'll save it for the next time around because we, we talked about the pods. So my statement is I'd rather negotiate with terrorists than fly down in a pod from an airplane or 
yeah. or jump out of the airplane with a parachute with William Mace being, all right, you're just going to pull this guy. And if it doesn't work, pull this guy. And then they're yeah, no training whatsoever. And there's just these and random we're right people. The are plane. Just, they're literally jumping out of the plane like, woo, wee, yeah. yeah. And it's just like, <laughs> this would not, this would not be it. I'd be bleeping myself down my leg if I had to like, would trying to come to the terms like, I'm about to parachute out of a GD airplane right now. <laughs> I will just, can I just go talk to the bad guy? Like, or even if you want to just use me as, as one of the guys is going to kill, I'll even maybe even take that. Like I, I'd want nothing to do with potting out of an airplane, jumping out of an airplane. What everyone's always like, would you ever try skydiving? How much would it take? I will never do it. I will never skydive. It Wait, so are no you saying that you me. are you saying that if given two choices, you can stay on the plane with terrorists, yeah. the plane that's leaking fuel, and probably crashes into a mountain somewhere. That's your first choice. Or you can, without any training, just slap this parachute on and jump out the back and figure it out that you would choose staying on the plane. I would, I would stay on the plane. I'm not <laughs> I'm, out there. I'm with Declan completely. I'm, on that. Out I'm totally with Declan. Yeah, they, I'm not potting out Here's my plane. question. Did they have any idea where they were parachuting to? Because it might have been the middle of the ocean. It, yeah, it, it it, so I like think they're it, all well, excited. It was. To, didn't it turn out that they didn't the yes, plane crash in the into ocean. the ocean? Yeah. But they're my point is cheering. Yeah. Woo! Like they're yeah. like they're jumping out of the plane like it's yes. fanfare. It's like and I yes. I'm sure there's some euphoria like oh my god we're getting out of this we we're all gonna die but it it, it it's not believable. And yeah, no but I would think that the it. uncertainty of never yeah. having parachuted before, not knowing where you're landing, if it's like in a it's desert close. in Africa or yeah. if you're right. over the Pacific That's Ocean, you just like don't really know. <laughs> I survived. Is that a lion coming at me? Yeah. Oh my God. And now I'm going to die. I'm going to land on a cactus. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it was. So my statement off, uh, off Dex's point, special effects here. Okay. <laughs> a little, little question. Effects takes. Okay. The special effects in this film, including the people jumping from the plane <laughs> and being shot against a green screen might be of all the films and we've watched a lot and there's some bad special effects. This one might be my favorite when the plane <laughs> crashes and breaks up and it looks like a, a Tom and Jerry cartoon, like the planes, a cartoon when they're jumping out of the plane and they show certain people against a green screen and they're like smiling and clapping. And it's just so clear that they are against a green screen. Like there's nothing about it. Like everything that they do with the shoot from the plane looks so damn phony that it's actually hilariously funny. So I remember watching this movie. I don't think I, it was in theaters, but watching this movie pretty soon after it hit like VHS or DVD or whatever in the late nineties, and I remember thinking how great the special effects were. Like, oh my gosh, yeah, they're showing this plane crashing into the ocean. And now you got 25 years of just technological advances. Judd, you're older than we are. When you watched movies from like the 70s or the 80s, did you think in the moment, like when you watched a Star Wars movie from way back, right? Just unparalleled special effects yeah. at the time. And now you look yep. back and you're like, that's weird. Did you think you were watching amazing special effects? Oh, yeah. I bet. Star yeah. Wars, the first one. Look cool. I want to say in the seventies though, with with like action films, they did different things because they knew that they they didn't even approach the technology. I think the problem by ninety seven is very simple. They had some technology at the time; it was great, right? But they overstepped their boundaries. Titanic so, did this too in nineteen ninety seven, where it's so like it became this, these people are falling off the boat, but it's very obviously like a green said, screen. Like they're, they're parachuting and they're like, you know, hold that yeah. pose. <laughs> Smile. <laughs> and so it's hilarious. But when the plane crashes, I mean, it is just, it is, it's a cartoon. Yeah. It's like somersaulting around. All right. I have a Mount Rushmore for you guys. Nice. My next statement is get off my plane is one of the most iconic action movie lines of all time. All right. And I have four on a Mount Rushmore for you here. If you okay. guys can think of other ones that I'm missing here, but I think I don't know what the George Washington actually the George Washington is probably Yippie Kaye Mother Bleeper from Die Hard. Yeah. Bruce yeah. Willis. It probably is, you're right. Yeah. Get off my plane is really good. And they zoom right in on his face and he just I get the chills every time that scene comes around. Uh, Hasta la vista, baby. 
oh, yeah. Terminator 2 Judgment Day. And I just remember as a kid, we just would say that to each other in like second grade because oh, yeah. it was popular in pop that was, culture. That was the first one that came to my mind is Terminator, that one. Okay. Yep. And I don't know that this is technically an action movie. It's more of like an action drama type movie. But Scarface, say hello to my little friend. Good one. Those are the four on, on my Mount Rushmore of iconic action movie or like, you know, uh, brooding male actor yeah. lines in, in a movie. Cool Hand Luke from the 70s, where, where the guy says, what we have here is a failure, failure to, communicate, to communicate, is okay. a pretty iconic yep. one. What about All Go these. Ahead, Make My Day from yeah, Dirty a, Harry? Or is that Good, good Bad, Good Bad, The Ugly? I think that's good, bad, bad, the ugly. The uh, dirty, hairy is. Do you feel lucky, punk? Yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. Those are good East ones too. Wood. Love Eastwood. Mm -hmm. Badass. Those so are that, all yeah. Good. Just like I don't know that line. Every time, like Harrison Harrison Ford just has a way of delivering the the key but line. Do do the lines. The Harrison Ford thing that the I absolutely the, love. The fugitive. You switch. You switch the samples. <laughs> <laughs> you switch the samples. Go <laughs> negotiate. Oh, <laughs> but the best part is I don't is, negotiate like, with terrorists. Terror. So there, there was a point in, in this film family. when the action started that Don said, turn it down a bit. Do you think I killed my wife? And I apologized because I said, here's the problem. Harrison Ford a lot of times sort of mumbles. Yeah. yeah. But then to deliver a key line, he does what, what, what you both just did, which is he gives it in this like uh, tone like this. Dude, I don't know if you guys had this or maybe if it was just you know my, my TV settings or something, but... 85% of the movie I had cranked up to one volume. And then every time there was a plane or they were showing a plane, it's like seven times the volume just pumping <laughs> yeah. through. And I had to, like, the neighbors think that there's some sort of attack I was trying attack to hear them, though. <laughs> President, speak up. I couldn't hear you. Yeah, mumbling to myself. That's why my family keeps <laughs> my plane. All right, uh, Declan. All right, so my statement is, I also, I want to go down an alternate reality path here because something was, I, I noticed something in Harrison Ford in this movie from another very prominent Harrison Ford movie. My statement is, this is the equivalent of Han Solo being the president of the United States. Oh, yeah. Good it totally is. Good he knows Air Force One like the back of his hand, right? Because he obviously flies on it every day, and he knows where the hiding spots are. He knows where things are. Han Solo flies the, Illum the Millennium Falcon and knows that plane, obviously, backwards and forwards. I think this is actually an alternate reality where Han Solo is the president of the United States. And it, and it literally, it took like halfway, it actually wasn't until like the actual like terrorists took over that I realized, oh my God, this is like, there's a lot of parallels here to Han Solo and, and the president. Yeah. So here's the thing. And I actually, as an actor like him, Harrison Ford, for the most part, plays Harrison Ford. Yes, he does. Like I like what you're saying. You're exactly right, Dex. But he's always playing himself. Like he has things, like looks, right? Like this. Watch this. Yeah. Like when they shoot his eyes <laughs> coming sure up that the was plane. It, but yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's this. It's like this. I don't know. Sort of like he's gonna cry, but he's a tough, a tough, hard ass guy. Yeah. And like they show him, and they show those the the clips when he comes up from the bottom of the plane, and they just focus on his eyes because they know the man has unbelievable eyebrow eyebrow control he he does no you're right there's also this so i, I it's funny i made I a mental note of his his amazing acting facial expressions yep there's the scene where he finally takes control of the plane and it's him and william h macy in the cockpit and they decide the plane is air force one is too damaged to actually land and they're trying to figure out what to do next and there's a pilot in one of the migs that's flying next to him uh, that kind of looks over. They look at each other through the windows, and yeah. he's telling him, "You know, Mr. President, you did a great job." And he, and he, you know, Mr. And then he says again, like, "Mr. President." And Harrison Ford gives him this, like, yeah. I, I can't even do the look, it's but like the dramatic, yeah, I know what and, you're talking about. Like he's this. telling a story with his face that's yeah. just yep. brilliant. So I'm going to blow yeah. Declan's mind even more here because I also went down this path. I love going down the like. This actor played this role in one franchise, yeah. but if you connect this other franchise, it could be a sequel, and we've done this yep. before on Action Movie Rewind. So the next movie that he made is a rom-com from the late 90s. We should totally do this in Rom-Com Rewind. Have you guys ever seen Six Days, Seven Nights? Six Days, Seven... No. I don't think so. So he is a small like puddle jumper pilot in this movie, 
just live in a, a simple life on an island and get stuck with this woman who is married to David Schwimmer, like annoying David Schwimmer. Oh, I, and they oh, wind up strand. Yeah. I think he, she she was like going on an island tour, and then the the plane. I can't remember what happens, but the plane winds up crashing on an island. And so his name is Quinn Harris, but he is this isolationist. Listen, I've left my previous life. I can still fly planes. I just want to live on islands and do nothing the rest of my life. <laughs> so you can envision Han Solo, you know, fighting these intergalactic wars up in the sky and then becomes president, leans yep. on his flying skills in Air Force One, and then just wants to be done with all of it. And so he retreats to some exotic island for six days, seven nights. Wow. Love me some Harrison Ford, man. I do too. And that doesn't even count the Indiana Jones tie-ins, too. Like I could see That's Indiana right. Jones becoming president of right. the United States. And then maybe, I don't know, where he learned to fly a plane somewhere in there. <laughs> he flew he flew a couple planes in the Indiana Jones movies. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Make it work. I'm just yeah. laughing at it. <laughs> uh, okay, back to is it back to Judd? Yes. I think it's back to me. Okay. Yep. So before Air Force One is incapacitated by all of the uh, f fact that they're told to um, bomb it, basically, or try and soda to create problems for the bad guys, blah, blah, blah. Here's my statement. From the beginning of the film on Air Force One, how much automatic fire can Air Force One take to its cabin? Because when the bad like from guys the, from the inside, yes, yes, because I've never the, thought about this. Because when totally the bad guys right. initiate basically the the uh, takeover of the plane, there is bullets are flying all over this plane like yeah. there's no tomorrow. And yes, they do hit people on some occasions uh, because I think they certainly get a pretty high kill rate. But it also like they're basically scattered throughout the plane. So, like, how much, and I know it's a tough plane, I know it can do a really good job, but how much can this plane take when it comes to internal, automatic, high-powered fire? Do you remember when we did uh, Snakes on a Plane, like, this time last summer? Yeah. yeah. And, and like, the end scene where Denzel, like, or Samuel, excuse me, like, convinced everyone to shoot all the windows yes. in the plane. And yes. I remember my, so my brother worked, was in the Air Force for six years. And I remember like we were talking about that scene and he said, if that were to happen, every single human being would be sucked out of those windows like that. Yeah. So like to Judd's point, like, yeah, how much can Air Force One really handle? Because like, I got to imagine bullets were flying out of that plane and then making the plane not aerodynamic anymore and probably would crash to its screaming halt. But Judd brings up a good point. Like how bulletproof is Air Force One? Internally. I would Internally. say it's probably less bulletproof than what they made it seem like in that movie. Yeah, I would agree right? with that. Has to be, has to be. All right. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna go. I, I don't know if you guys noticed this, but my next statement is: What terrible reporting by CNN? <laughs> so there is a moment in this oh, movie boy. where they're sitting in the Situation Room. Okay. And I think it was uh, someone notifies the vice president, you know, Madam Vice President, take a look at this. And they flip the TV on and it's coming out of a commercial. So, hey, how'd they time it that well? So they're just like, they're flipping on. And how, how did they know that CNN was going to break this? But so CNN comes on and says, we have unconfirmed reports that Air Force One has crashed. Yes. Yeah. Let's unpack that for a second. Okay. Yep. You are a national news network, and I don't want anyone to get on me. This is a this is a referendum on the fictional 1997 version of CNN. I don't Fox want to have news a discussion. Gets this right. <laughs> I don't want to have a discussion about like current CNN versus Fox, MSNBC. But in the fictional world of 1997, okay. Oh God, yeah. You have news that you've maybe kind of heard unconfirmed, as the reporter says on TV, that the president's plane has crashed, which a is incorrect, and b. If the reports that you're hearing are unconfirmed and obviously incorrect, why are you breaking into programming yeah. to panic the audience? Wouldn't you try to get, I don't know, a second source on this? This is where I'm going to turn it over to a journalist, Judd, here, who yeah. spent most of his life as a reporter. Yeah, you would never. You can't, like, you wouldn't even go on, you wouldn't no. even, like, go on and say, we have unconfirmed reports that uh, uh, Mike Zimmer is retiring or something. Right. Like, you would, you would confirm it. <laughs> Right. And then you would report it. <laughs> I, I mean, it's basically what 20, uh, 26 years before the uh, fact. It's reckless speculation involving the president's plane. Yes. Yeah. 
We have unconfirmed reports that yeah. Air Force One has crashed. I'm sorry. First of all, what? You're, you haven't confirmed this news? Yeah, but we're going with it. That's what I love. <laughs> Go with it. Just throw it out there. You're right. I, I didn't write that down, but that is so funny. You're That's exactly one, right. And then later on, they got it right. And then it was then, then their reporting became well honed like an hour later in the movie where uh, they're up in the sky, but the plane is too damaged to land, and they're trying to figure it out. It's like, oh, so... Now you've got someone. And who's feeding them that information? Is someone in the situation room just like sending text messages to CNN producers? It's just, well, you couldn't text in 1997. So no. I don't even know. We think it crashed. We're not quite sure, but go with it. <laughs> Stick with us after this commercial break. All right. Uh, I, I, on that exact topic, uh, I noticed that uh, I forget who plays the press secretary when she like addresses that part of like, there's been a report that, that the plane crashed, whatnot. My, my thought was actually, I would love to see Judd as a press secretary. I think Judd would oh, do PR. a phenomenal job uh -huh. at trying to wrangle. Like, not phenomenal. Let me rephrase that. I would be. I think it'd be wildly entertaining to watch Judd Zolgad run a press secretary room. I think it'd be amazing. It was the, <laughs> you were the first person before she even finished her rant. I was like, man, Judd would be um, hilarious at this role. I, <laughs> I, I would be. I would be fired from PR within my first day. Oh, PR threw... is, I admire those folks. It is the worst. Like to convey, to work with people who do what we do, I would absolutely, my head would pop off. It would be, it would be a pain in the ass. And doing it at that level would be even and more then the of a problem pain is, in the ass. And then the problem is your boss would get mad if you didn't do things right. So you would tell your boss to basically F off and then you'd be fired for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But I mean, it would be funny. I think Declan's right. It's just I wouldn't last. Did you see? Wasn't there another scene too where all of the media was gathered in the press room while they were pumping in the audio from yes. the cockpit? Right? Yeah. Well, they were and like, that, "Would they like, do that?" All right, everyone, we're just going to broadcast this to the nation. Basically, what's this yes. crisis moment that's happening? And then explain to me they're pumping into the plane when when Raddick is being let go. Um, people singing and rejoicing and that's like because he he's like listen to this and he like turns the dials up yeah and they're pumping into the plane how, how would that work my the only best... thought there is that it was a tv feed if there's a tv station but how would right. there be a how would there be tv that's... cameras just like randomly in that prison and how would they know like that's going to be okay radic might get out tonight yeah and, and the best part about that press room like them listening to it is like some people are like actively like Oh my God, like on the yes. edge of their seat, like, you know, huddled around the radio. And then there's like a few of them like doing their diligent, diligent reporting, like taking notes of like all the things that are being said. It, it's, it's a hilarious scene. I thought the same thing that was like super funny. <laughs> it's so, yeah. pretty good. It's like a so comedy. Realistic. Uh, back to Judd here. Statements continuing. Um, opening scene of the film. The efficiency in the opening scene yeah. is impressive. They And I love it because... It's quick, like there's a story to tell, but they didn't get stuck on that, that story. So the efficiency of basically taking Raddick and putting him in jail is, I mean, if government really operated that way, it'd be in good shape. Like it's bang, 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 in and out, like a double play. They get him, he's in bed, they roust him. Hey, wake up, Mr. Raddick. They kill his guards, they take him, and we are done. Like, it's incredible. It, it's not, they kill a bunch of, of his soldiers. But if you think about the efficiency there and the lack of fight back, right? And like, this guy is a bad guy. He is going to have a lot of guards. And I love how they're, they're just like, oh, no, no, no. This just worked like this. That is good efficiency. Yeah, no, it was good. It was pretty, pretty swift. It kind of reminded me of the, like, the, the true story of how they went and got uh, Zero Dark Thirty, right? Where they went and they kind of documented yeah cinematically the uh, osama bin laden capture you know, it kind of reminded me of that um all right this is i think this might be my last statement i might have another one here too but the mole the secret service mole yeah waited entirely too long I to agree. intervene i agree so first of all i thought from a movie standpoint it was it was brilliant and there's in the in the show notes on wikipedia there was some back and forth about when they would reveal the mole. Yep. And it was decided that they would reveal the mole early so that they could have a couple suspenseful scenes later. Like when Harrison Ford hands him a gun inside yeah. the conference room, it's like, so they could have a couple little foreshadowing and tense moments. Yeah. 
So this guy is working with the terrorists. And the terrorists, at first, I get it. Like, hey, there's 50 hostages in here. Let's just, let's just, you're going to be a mole here, and we're going to, we'll figure out when to unveil you at some point. He waits until all of the terrorists get killed. Yep. Which means, by the way, no one knows he's a mole. Like, all the people that know he's a mole, the president doesn't know he's a mole at that point. Yeah. Why would you t- why would you pick that point in time? Wouldn't you intervene when the odds are stacked in your favor a little bit more? Okay, there's still like four terrorists alive. I'm going to join him the fifth, and we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna come in and be the closer here. We're gonna get this thing back on the tracks. So and he waits till all of them are dead, and then he decides, okay, now I'm gonna try and take over here, dude. That guy could have gotten away scot free. Could have picked another spot at some point in the next two or three years to get his revenge. It just made the, the, the timing made no sense to me. And here's my question too. So that last scene or before the plane crashes at least, all right? So he decides that he is going to abandon the president and he is going to get that that last ride on the rope before the plane crashes. Mm -hmm. Did he really think that he was going to leave the president there and that they were going to allow him to zip line to them right and he and that they, they would just say oh thank god you lived where's the president oh he's he perished. yeah how is he going to explain like, that one away and they're watching this happen i'm assuming yes. from the other plane right so that so like like i don't understand the thought process behind that scene at all he waited too long man he waited yeah, I, too long i think you're right the other funny thing about that whole story arc so apparently there was I don't know how long it was, but like call it a five or ten minute arc that explained his backstory and why he became this rogue. He was he was a, oh. he was some sort of a, a military man who felt jaded by the system and like they didn't take care of him and his family or whatever. Or he had a falling out with the president at some point um, or what, I don't remember what it was, but there's a whole backstory that they did have in the original version of the movie. But yep. then when they were trying to cut it down under two hours, they said, ah, oh, we don't need this guy's backstory. Just He's a mole. People can draw their own conclusions as to what he's actually angry about. Uh, another one for me here. Uh, I can tell you right now, the 12-year-old, his daughter, who says, like, Dad, I'm ready for the world. You are clearly not. <laughs> like, And this is classic action movie arc of being like, Dad, like, I'm now an adult. Like, you have to start, I'm getting to adulthood. You have to start treating me like adult. 30 minutes later, you are in a hijacked airplane. You are <laughs> not ready for the world. And if I'm, and, and, and Harrison Ford does a brilliant job of like, don't, don't hurt my family. Please don't, please don't hurt my family. Whatever you're doing, just don't hurt my family. But like, I would, if I was Harrison Ford and the, or if I was him and I was talking to my daughter in that situation, like, see, there's Told no you. chance you're ready for the At world. any given just, point, terrorists we, could pop out of nowhere. And... We just spent two and a half hours and we're, and we're ziplined across an airplane, sweetheart. We are what? not ready. You are not ready for the Life world. comes at you fast, honey. Yeah. All right. You're probably yeah. wondering how I got here. Yeah, it, that, that's pretty much. It was so ridiculous. Judd, any other statements from you here before we get into the, yes. the rankings? A common theme of this film, the amount of premature celebrations that go on in this film overall yeah. <laughs> is yeah. off the charts yeah like the white house people good news everyone's like yay that's great i mean you are in a crisis situation you know that many of your co-workers are dead like i don't care if the president lives or not this is a very dark day really in american history and every time that something goes their way they celebrate like they jump up and down, uh, yay! We, uh, I mean, Air Force One crashed, it bleeping crashed, and you know, this plane is now changing to Air Force One. Ah, <laughs> what the hell is that? It's kind of like what was the was it Independence Day where we that we deduced through one of the sequel books that three billion people probably perished during yes. the Independence Day War, but. But at the end of the movie, it's like, yes, celebration, oh yes. Like, no, the world and the, the, e- the economy and the world's infrastructure are going to be screwed up forever yeah. now. But celebrate. Yeah, it's great. Um, all right. Anything else from you guys, statements-wise? Yeah, just a more of a question. Uh, could you just, like, call the White House in the 90s? Is, was, that, was that a thing that you can, like, and I'm sure, I'm, I suppose there is a phone line that you can still call the White House. But I thought Trace that the was, call. you just, or the call. call. Here's the call. Um, I thought it was absurd. He just calls the White House. He just, he just, he just calls it. And also, can we get working cell phones on airplanes? 
Like, and, and how, how is this still not? How can we not make a phone call yet on a current airplane in 2022? And like he he is able to do it because he's on Air Force One. And he has the special plane or special phone, whatever. But my two main takeaways were just like I don't know. You could just call the White House, and two, yeah. can we just also start having the ability to use our cell you phones? Know, I, I, I think you can. Well, you can't make a call. You can't make a call. I thought you can't so. Call. Oh, really? Can't call on your I, cell phone. No. It, it's it's not allowed. I thought that there were instances w- where you could call. I don't think you call. can get any bars when you're thirty thousand feet above. Well, I think I if you're think lower, so. you can. Yeah, you're probably right. At cruising altitude, you're you're probably right. But I'm I've good without it. I don't where, I don't need. Yeah, that. no, it drives me nuts really, when like yeah. you're sitting in there and I don't know. There's yeah. it's always like an old imagine? person too. Just. Yeah, we're, so we're gonna be there. At, I think we land around two Gate, o'clock, and Gate then B. and then you know, Katie's gonna pick us up. It's like just just send a text. I want an airplane mm-hmm. to be a quiet place. I do not want to hear phone calls. I think I'm mostly with you on this one. I do not want to hear. Oh, I got one more. Okay, mm-hmm. the continuing theme, and I think that this also applied um, to one of the last couple AMRs that we did as well. For all the president went through. His suit remained in remarkable shape. It was pretty, yeah, it was pretty good. Um, it finally gets torn up at the end when he essentially almost hits the ocean at full speed. But, like, he goes through fights, tie stays on. It's undone a little bit. Uh, that His suit in remarkable shape, and he never once, I don't think, takes his jacket off. That's what I was going to say. At some point, wouldn't you take the jacket off and roll the sleeves up like a weatherman? I mean, weathermen take the jacket off yes. if there's a little bit yes. of wind coming into the Twin Cities. I would have. And the, the president, though, mm-mm, can never loosen the tie, can never take the jacket off, even if there's terrorists trying to kill my family and 50 passengers. I'm looking good. Where's mm. my jacket? Get off my plane. Where's uh, my suit coat? You know who fits a lot better in a suit coat these days is Judd Zolgad, skinny Judd Zolgad. That's exactly right, and that's thanks to my friends at Livia Weight Control Centers. I am down 40 pounds. Been talking about that for quite some time now. Dawn has joined me within the first three weeks. She is down 10 pounds, and I'm going to tell you right now, this program is great because it not only helps you lose the weight, which is obviously the, the most important start to things, but also helps you maintain the weight loss. The maintenance phase is where I'm at right now, and it's been fantastic. Simple start plan, only $59, 855-GO-L-I-V-E-A, Livia.com, L-I-V-E-A.com, if you want that suit coat to fit you better. Also, a shout out to our friends at Federated Mutual Insurance Company. So they've been around for over 100 years helping business owners in and around the Twin Cities area and beyond. And they're all about risk management tools and resources to help you maximize the success of your business Federated's history is rich with innovative, committed people guided by a core set of principles and values that they apply to your business. Find out more at federatedinsurance.com. All right, we get to the ranking categories here on Action Movie Rewind. Let's start with the definitive villain rankings. We're looking for three different criteria here to judge terrorist Igor by... How iconic is the villain? How ruthless is the villain? And how charismatic is the villain all put together in a stew on a 1 to 10 scale? So to this point, Caster Troy from Face Off is a 9 out of 10. The aliens from Independence Day are a 7.8. Surfer Bodhi from Point Break is a 7.3. The F5 Tornadoes from Twister are a 6.3. And the British car-loving gangster from Gone in 60 Seconds is a 1.3 on a 1 to 10 scale. So let's talk terrorist Igor. So he's ruthless for sure, mm-hmm. and I think he's—I think it's safe to say charismatic. I don't know if he's considered iconic. He's not. He gets like, overshadowed I, by the plane by Harrison Ford. Yep. Yeah, and, and just to be clear here, Oldman's a great actor. Like he's Love really, Oldman. he's really, really good. So this is. So I think he actually made a lot with with what he had. But Phil, I think you're right. I think the fact that there were storylines that basically were more important than him hurts the iconic. I'm going to give him a seven and a half because hmm. I think he's good. Um, but like the iconic thing, we've certainly reviewed iconic characters. Feels like he falls short there, or I should say that character does. So I'm going to give it a seven and a half. I love Gary. He's one of my favorites. Him as Commissioner Gordon in the Batman trilogies with Christopher Nolan is phenomenal. 
Um, but yeah, I don't really look him as iconic. He certainly is ruthless, but he, he doesn't really stand out to me. So to me, he's just a five and a half. It, it, he's fine. Um, and honestly, I love Gary so much. I want to bump him up higher, but the character itself is just kind of meh. It, it, it's not really that iconic to me. So it, it's a five and a half for me. Yep, it's a six and a half for, or no, it's a six. I, I have a six written down here, which brings it to a 6.3 average score between the three of us. And so my reasoning for giving him a lower score, it's not the performance. He was excellent in this role. It's just the way that they kind of wrote it and the way that they just teed up his character. It was kind of replaceable. Like, you could have put any number of actors in there. His kills were good, though. Sure. I'm, uh, yeah. They but, were very ruthlessly go- well done. But I'm saying, like, Caster Troy, you couldn't just swap out another actor for Caster Troy. It was Nick Cage made Caster Troy iconic and part of the John Travolta. They both I did. Travolta, I thought Travolta was a great Caster Troy. So it's a 6.3 tied with the F5 Tornadoes from Twister. Wow, Gary. Sorry, Gary Oldman. And that brings us to the entertainment value of this movie on a 1 to 10 scale. So far, uh, since we rebooted Action Movie Rewind, the most entertaining movies we've reviewed are Top Gun Maverick, a 9.3, Independence Day, 8.7, and Top Gun the Original, 8.3. Gone in 60 Seconds is the lowest one at 4.7 to this point. Judd? Okay. I actually enjoy this film a lot. Like, like for all of the flaws that you now see in 2022, it's still a good watch. Um, I'm going to give it, again, in fact, I'll stay consistent, 7.5. Wow. I feel like that's a little disrespectful. I'll give it a 7.5. Okay. Declan? Uh, yeah, first time I've ever seen this movie. Uh, you know, like I said, there were some parallels to to my guy uh, uh, Han Solo that I really enjoyed, and it's it's funny. Um, there's some quirky little moves uh, in, in the movie. I don't know if I would go out of my way to watch this ever again. Get I like off it. My plane. It's the perfect movie. Get off was... my podcast. Yeah, yeah. Get off my action movie rewind. I think it's the perfect movie if you're stuck in your hotel room and like you turn on a movie to watch before you go to bed. That that's how I look at Air Force One. Makes I'm not going to seek it out, but if I turned on the remote on in a Holiday Inn, Declan here for Holiday Inn and Suites, and if it was on, I would stop and watch the movie. But uh, outside of that, nah. I, it's a seven though. It's a seven out of wow. ten for me. It, wow. It, it, I don't. I don't think it's like iconic. It's not one of the favorite movies I've ever done before. It's a little long too, by the way. In my opinion, I feel like it's long. All those films um, are long. Yeah. So it's a seven, which like I don't think is that disrespectful. But it's just a, it's a seven out of ten. I think for me. Phil's going to come off the top rope here with it. I am. I'm not changing my score. It's a ten for me. This is <laughs> one of this is god. legitimately one of my oh yes. my god. Score movie. Yes. This oh. is le- so you, you got to understand. I love Harrison Ford. Okay. Harrison Ford is one of my favorite actors of all time. You're not doing the Harrison Ford face. I know because I can't do the eyebrows. <laughs> he he's got eyebrow control. I don't have, so I just try to look like I'm going to cry. Indiana Jones, the Indiana Jones franchise. Yeah. I know most people got hooked in in the Star Wars era, but the Indiana Jones franchise and The Fugitive are literally some of my favorite movies ever. The Fugitive's fantastic. And, Indiana uh, Jones is okay. But when you're a kid, like you get hooked right. on Indiana Jones and the Fugitive was great. I was 12 years old when I first saw Air Force One, and the combination Man. of of my age, the era. Whenever this movie is on, I am glued to it. I don't care if it's the beginning or near the end. Like I'm just in on this movie at every single angle. So the way it hits for me, it's a 10. This is an amazing movie. It's entertaining, it is and entertaining. Uh, Harrison Ford just hits differently. For old Did Mac you see it here. in theaters? I don't think so, but I okay. think I saw it uh, like first release out on VHS sure. when I was a kid. Yep. Pretty pretty sure. We used to rent movies for, we do like four movies during Christmas Day or something. So I'm pretty sure yeah. that's when I saw it. Blockbuster? Probably. Oh, or um, Blockbuster. Hollywood Movies was probably, we had a Hollywood yeah, movie in, yeah. in Maple Grove. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go over there. And then there was a Blockbuster nearby too. So, so that, right. that gives it an 8.2, which is outside the top three, but just ahead of Face Off and Point Break. For this one. Uh, all right. For the next action movie rewind, we did do this one in the original run, but it's been two years. And I'd like for it to start a run where we do as many of these as possible. Fast and the Furious the is making its return. The yeah. original Fast and the Furious. Oh, yeah. I remember that one. And then oh, I yeah. think, you know, once every month or two, we can chip away at Too Fast, Too Furious and 
whatever the third one is. Fast, Fast Five was one of the the best of the bunch, but Fast and the Furious for next week, gentlemen. I'll take the tuna. I What's the runtime on Fast and Furious? I forget. It's about three and a half hours. Yeah, you're gonna want to build in that's build in an app. <laughs> Thank God for the fast forward button. Here, I'll I'll find it real quick here for you, just so you can. I did watch it a lot. Fast and Fury and the Furious. It's not bad. Yeah, the first one's really good. It's got good special effects. Mm-hmm. I saw it in theaters. Well, okay, in the, theaters. the like 10. Fast and the Furious. Okay, I just went to the wrong one because there is a Fast and Furious. Yep. But That's then like the Fast third. and the Furious well, with the don't, does. Don't they want to get a little farther apart, name wise? All right. It's an hour and forty minutes. Who's Perfect quick, shot. Huh? Yep. Hour and forty minutes. Okay. Yeah, it's so Fast and Furious. I mean, I just miss it. It can't be three hours if it's called Fast and Furious. Yeah. Yep. Although I, I think the the latest ones are fairly long. I think. I think yeah, those like, are like Gone with the Wind length feature yeah. films. Godfather, and yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyhow, that was Action Movie Rewind here on Mackie and Judd. Diving deep, way too deep, into some of the biggest action movies of all time.